What's up, everybody? It's Quinton from Hunters of Light, and uh, today we've got some more underwater action. We've got uh, Gyu Pluto, who's going to be taking us through some of his work. Um, he's uh, quite a multi-talented uh, artist. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's completed some art, uh, award-winning uh, works in architecture, jewelry, sculpture, and of course, uh, photography. Um, and in the photography side of things, um, he's uh, been awarded in a couple of competitions, United Nations World uh, Oceans Day, uh, Nature's Best Africa, Africa Geographic, Ocean Art, Deep Visions, and the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. So uh, I think we've, uh, we've got royalty in our midst today. Um, do you, if uh, you want to tell us what you've been doing during lockdown, welcome, by the way. It's, uh, it's good to have you on. Yeah, thank you, Quentin. And, and thank you very much for the invitation and also for Johan Freilang, who put me in touch with yes. um, Well, lockdown was obviously, I think, a, a tough time for for most of us, especially if you're an outdoor person like myself. And, and I spent uh, a great deal of my time underwater and not being able to go <laughs> to the ocean. Uh, it, it, it was a challenge. But um, I think in every, every challenge is always to find a, a, a light point or a good point. And it, it made me look at what was around me. And I had really nice fun in the end taking photos of, of the wild birds in, in the garden and around. So, yeah. It didn't stop the passion. <laughs> uh, it's crazy how we've we've kind of had to overcome, uh, you know, this lockdown thing with uh, shooting things that uh, that maybe we wouldn't normally, uh, just because that's that's all we have. You know, I mean, trying to shoot portraits, for example, when you can't uh, be in touch with people, <laughs> that's pretty tricky. You know, so I understand completely. <laughs> Yes, um, I must just say, uh, I don't know if you want me to give you the feedback, but the, the sound is uh, going and uh, it's not coming through all the time. So I'm missing some, some of your words. Well, that, um, that first part I had myself on mute. So uh, yeah. that, was, that was completely okay. my fault. I know your, yours sort of comes in and out every now and then, um, but let's see what we can do. I think what, what we can do is when, when we share your screen, um, if you uh, hit that little mm -hmm. button on the bottom left that says stop video, um, then what will happen is that it, it won't be trying to send your, your video uh, view as well as the, the PowerPoints. Um, so maybe let's, let's, uh, let's jump onto the sharing the screen um, and then we can, uh, okay. uh, we can start that. Because I know we, we had to do this the other day. Okay. All right, there we go. I can and see. Where do I find the bottom that you want? Uh, just the bottom, bottom left where it says stop video. Oh, okay. See, then, the, then it's basically just your um, the data from the um, the slideshow that's uh, that's yes. coming through. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we can move on from this slide. To if yeah. To introduce myself. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, today's talk will be an underwater photography. Um, this is okay. So I'm based in Cape Town. And when I started with my diving and shortly after that with underwater photography, I had a person who told me that if you want to make a name in underwater photography, Cape Town is not the place to be. And that I saw as a good challenge. <laughs> and I love challenges. Um, I could see where they were coming from. Um, obviously, the one big uh, negative in Cape Town is the water temperature. Um, that put a lot of people off from spending time in, in Cape Town diving. And I always find it very sad because uh, you have quite a number of people who is trained scuba divers, but they never even dived in Cape Town, purely just because of the temperature. And what makes it further sad is when they actually get to see the variety Cape Town underwater life has to offer, it's phenomenal. It is. I had a friend who stayed in Mauritius. Uh, he was Cape Town, but he started diving when he was overseas, left in Mauritius, and he dived there for three months, three months solid. He came to Cape Town one dive and he said to me, it's way better than Mauritius. So it, it just shows the, what, what it's like, I would say the, the, the richness that Cape Town has topside is what it has underwater and equally, if not more. So 
it's it's one of my big passions is to share that with divers and non-divers alike because it's so important to get that awareness out there and and see people developing appreciation for what our underwater life has to offer yeah the only the only thing with so, um, with wanting to to see that is that you need to be wearing wear. two two five mil uh, um, wetsuits and uh, a couple of caps uh, yeah. and booties etc have to, have to be a little prone <laughs> to, to ignore the, the cold yeah. and um, I mean it is a real factor um, I'll maybe uh, talk a little bit of, on it later on but like it's it's one of the challenges that I had to uh, deal with, combining the especially when I do the macro photography underwater, where you're often a lot more stationary, and uh, um, that means that the cold get to you sooner because you're not moving and, and generating body heat. So yeah, and and then you have to really just put it out of your mind and, and keep on working, and that's where it it. As much as I love it, it's so difficult sometimes. I can see it in people's eyes when you say, I'm going diving. And it's just like, okay, he's going to go have fun. But no, I'm actually going working. <laughs> it's one of those things where I always tell, it's like, if it was just so much fun, I would see a lot more people in the water with me. Yeah, it would be very crowded. I'm the only one there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, I, I still love it. And then that's my, uh, it's, it's one of those things in life where I think one can always be just so grateful for is what you, when, when you love what you do, um, I mean, what more can you ask for? Um, so when I started, I started with a little compact camera. It was Olympus. Uh, it was just uh, the camera in the housing. Um, uh, I will quickly touch on that maybe as well on, on the gear side of things. So how it works is uh, the cameras we use on the water is the cameras that you will use on land as well. The only difference is for each model, there is a purpose made housing being built. And that housing can either be from polycarbonate or from uh, aluminum where they take a solid block of aluminum and then they machine the housing out of that to, to fit that specific model of camera. So. To that, you will ha then have to, if it's a DSRL, obviously have to add lenses and also what we call strobes, which is top what we normally talk about flashes. And that gives us the ability to, to then provide light underwater to take the photos that we want to take. Um, so when I started off, I only had a small uh, compact uh, and in a plastic or polycarbonate housing. Uh, sadly, that one got stolen quite early on in my career, and thereafter I switched over to a Canon S10, also in, in uh, the Canon housing, which is a polycarbonate housing. And that system I then built up. The benefit one has on the compact cameras is because you've got a built-in zoom lens on most of those models, the, what the manufacturers do is they manufacture then what you call wet lenses. So the wet lens you then attach to the outside of the housing, which allows you during one dive to take both say macro photos and wide and cut the various wet lenses. As opposed to the SRL setups, you have to decide before the dive, is it going to be solely a macro dive or solely a wide angle dive and gear up for that. And once you obviously in the water, even that once in the water, by the time you uh, arrive at the dive site, normally that's fixed and locked, and that's what you'll be using. So to, to my second compact system, I build up my strobes and uh, wet lenses. And by the time I had those, that's when I was ready for my first trip overseas. And I thought I was ready and I was very happy to go. And the destination was Madagascar. And it was mainly a surf trip. Surfing is my other big love uh, in, in, in as far as sport and wildlife is concerned. And on that trip, I learned a couple of very bad lessons. Some of them painful lessons or very sad lessons in the sense that good advice is when you travel with your underwater gear is when you get to your destination, you should do a test dive. And normally you would want to do that in a pool and you do that 
just with the housing, without the camera inside the housing, because the, the gear might have got damaged in the transit. And that way you just ensure that everything is working properly. I, I didn't do that. Oh, <laughs> we no. had a pool, but I was too, too, too keen to get and go and test out. And on that first test dive, I flooded my camera. So oh, that man. whole trip was a very sad trip. So that was the one lesson. The other lesson that you will often see uh, underwater photographers uh, uh, practice is to have two mo two bodies of the same uh, camera model. So if something like that happens, that you have your backup, and that's why you, you can't have like now I'm shooting Nikon. I can't have a a crop sensor body and a full frame body. You have to have the two because the one won't fit into the right. housing unless you travel with two housings. But that becomes just too too much gear, and and I mean it, the expense is also considerable. So that was uh, the one lesson is follow those protocols, do your test dive, do it in the pool without the camera. The, the great lesson that came from it was on, I still went diving and, and on the dive, the second dive I did was the, the instructor, oh and by the way the, the photo on, on the bottom right hand side, that was the dive center. <laughs> It's just a gift. It was a really rural area and location. So the dive center is about the size of the, the bungalow I was staying on, which is the, the picture on the left hand side. Right. But he observed me in the diving and he could see I was a, a, a comfortable diver or a, a skilled diver. And so it was me and two other people that wasn't part of my group that was going to do the second dive. And he told me, well, he's happy if. Uh, they get to the end of their air consumption, which was very fast. He's happy for me to carry on diving. And that sounded like a good deal to me, although we always thought not to do it. But doing it taught me a valuable lesson on how the wildlife reacted differently to me being the only person in the water. And today I've got over 6,000 hours solo diving. Sure. Most of them is in Cape Town. So I've got about 5,800 hours solo. So I always say it's like anything in life that you do, if you know the consequences, if you know the dangers, and you practice how to minimize those, it minimizes the risk. It's like to tell a person who goes and climbs Everest, no, they, they shouldn't do it because it's dangerous. Yes, it's dangerous, but they train for it. So is that something that I go around and advise people to, people to do to go and do solo diving? Because from my side, I've, I've done the training, I've done my time and I've put in systems in place to make sure that I'm as safe as possible. But that safety gave me a freedom which otherwise I wouldn't have, uh, uh, which otherwise I would not have had. For example, uh, when I started uh, before that trip and you always work on the body system and then you so often get a day where there's good diving, but you don't have a buddy. So this whole day just gone missing. Um, and it, it was just one of those things that showed to me the only option forward as a photographer, underwater photographer was to get skilled in, in solo diving and get comfortable with that. Um, so today's presentation I've divided into five topics and the topics is macro photography, abstract, wide angle, the essence, and natural history. So most underwater photographers, they tend to be either loving macro photography or wide angle photography. And I'm not sure if it comes from that where they so focus to what they have to choose gear wise before the dive or if it's just personality that, that depicts, di dictates that. And then you get some people like me who truly love both. I truly love macro photography. And I truly love wide angle photography. And I'm really glad for it because uh, Say in Cape Town, we are less likely to have good visibility, but we've got 
tremendous macro life. So if I was only into wide angle photography, I would only be diving a fraction of the time and getting a fraction of the work uh, or material compared to what I'm able to do loving both. I also think what uh, the macro offers is it offers you insight into the fragile nature of the ocean and just once again highlights that to me and then helps me to to spread the word just like how careful we have to be when we interact with with the ocean because often the things that as, as we walk into the ocean often in the sand that we walk on there's creatures living there or the rocks that we walk over and normally we don't take that into consideration so yeah so the presentation will be looking at those two main categories of, of photography but the other three I've included is like themes or ongoing projects I, I have in my workflow or what I keep in the back of my mind and I think in photography it's, it's good to always have that personal projects that you work on um, I think with underwater photography the difference to me compared to my topside photography projects is they're much longer ongoing because with underwater photography, I never know what I'm going to find. So you build up a slow but sure reference bank in your memory of things you want to do, things that you hope to see in this place or that place, but there's no guarantee. You don't even know beforehand what the visibility is going to be like in, in general, unless you stay right next to the ocean and, and, and you can have, have a look. So that's why those projects that takes a much longer period for me, but I think it's fine. It, it, it just, it, it, I think the limitations maybe that I have less personal projects, but much longer going in, in underwater photography is the end result. So now we move on to the first topic, the, the macro photography. So the macro photography leans itself towards portrait studies of, of creatures and obviously small creatures. It also, um, to me, the, the macro side, which is so nice, is like underwater photography or, or uh, diving on its own. It's really like going to another world. And then when you start focusing on the, the under, uh, on, onto the macro side, it's like yet again going to a completely different world. And then the last couple of years, we started also really focusing on super macro. And even that again is like, it's, it's, it's just such different creatures compared to what you see in macro, compared to what you see in wide angle. And each of those is like, you, you, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just another world every time. And, and I think um, that's, that's kind of what to me is a little bit mind boggling. It's like, if you're already a diver, that you will not want to spend time on looking at the macro stuff as well and only want to focus on, on the wide angle. But I mean, every person to its own, but that's just how, how my brain works. So one of the features that you learn about when you do your dive course is what we call nudibra. And this is a nudibra, it's an elegant nudibra, uh, Cape Town species. And uh, that's also something I would like to, to highlight from the presentation today. All but two of the photos in the whole presentation was taken in South Africa, and most of them was taken in Cape Town. So it's, it's just, sorry, but I have to do it, is make that awareness of, of the richness that our country actually has to offer. And you so seldom see South Africa and even less Cape Town as a dive destination. But surely, but surely, I mean, I've seen how that growth has taken place over the years. I've been uh, busy diving and taking photos because the work that's coming out of the country and, and that word spreads. And then people who are unaware of what's available here now see the need to come here and, and want to take also in that, in, in that experience. Um, so just, just to get back to the nudibra, um, so you learn about it and I can clearly remember myself asking, okay, so what is a nudibra? And uh, the answer is, is a type of a sea slug. And then I was like, but 
why would we learn about a sea slug in, in your dive course? Like, just how, how fundamental can these, or amazing can these sea slugs be? And then this, that is until you see your first one and you start learning about them. And I would really uh, encourage people to go and Google Nudibra. It is the animal species in the whole animal kingdom which have the biggest subspecies variety. They come in a tremendous variety of colors, shapes, patterns. Uh, it, it's just, I think almost, it's like close to, I think a thousand new ones gets discovered each year, something like that. Sure. It, it, it's just endless variety of wow when you get to, to look at them. And they make for a really great macro subject because of the colors they are interesting to, to look at uh, feature wise. Um, from a photography point of view, what I've learned with, uh, and, and that goes all the different categories that we'll touch on today, but it was good to see it at the macro level because often the mistake is made by people when they think about your wide angle and you think about big subjects like your seals or your sharks, our uh, mind says they're fast moving. But their movement is also in a big space where those people often say, yeah, the macro stuff is so easy because they just sit there, they just stole. <laughs> but actually when you look through a, a macro lens and you consider that you are moving in the swell, they are moving the subject, the subject is often sitting on something that is also moving, then it actually makes for split second decisions that you have to be at the right place the right time and the subject in in, in a elegant because you can imagine all these fine little tentacles on its back they're all swaying in the spirits they and, and so it's the whole thing flapping around so yeah it, it was a good exercise in learning to take the photo at the right time and i think macro the, the the structure the macro photography brought to my work then i could transfer it to my wide angle even much easier so for me personally i find the the, the wide angle photography much easier than the macro but i think it's, it's because I've, I've highlighted the 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 need in the macro to take the macros at the right time and to take th those photos at the right time actually takes very fine timing. It also uh, made the, the macro side makes it a lot more difficult to get your lights positioned correctly um, because you're working with obviously a, a smaller creature. So if your lighting is off, it will show up much stronger. Where if you take just a scene of, of a reef and if your light is slightly off, it will still look like just. The, the, the scene is, is lit up unless it's it's way off then it, it will stand out but i'll touch on that a little bit more later as well so the nudies all, although they they're moving and everything's moving they still they're still on the reef they're not swimming so the next step up on the, on the macro side is then to start focusing on, on fish portraits because they obviously they're now moving um and here as with the nudies one of the uh, key, I would say, uh, it's not skills, but aims in underwater photography and I think in other wildlife photography is, is to uh, separate your subject from the background. And the benefit we have in underwater photography is that we both have natural light and then your um, artificial light, which is the strokes. And because we have the, the, the strokes with us, we are able to achieve these back backgrounds, even in daytime, compared to seeing the busy reef behind it. So the, the, the workflow is to illuminate your subjects purely with your artificial light and don't let any of your natural light get into the photo or illuminate your sensor. And that's how you then separate it in, in this manner. Um, From there on, I think what I've touched on now is for me, how important it is to have good lighting. And 
that's one of the nice things about underwater photography is uh, our studio is both working with the natural light and then the artificial light. But it is also something that you have to master. And once you've mastered your light and understand how the placement of your lights works or the impact that will have, is when you can start creating it, uh, using it creatively. And I think like here, it's like, for me, it was like almost like a cave, the, the open mouth created. And I knew if I can get the light into the, into the actual mouth of the eel and highlight that yellow and, and have the, the foreground the, under the chin, not exposed with light, it will just highlight, uh, further enforce that, that cave feel. And then obviously have light also um, flow over onto the eyes. I was just um, going to say that many of my it, uh, the, it looks like uh, you've actually yeah. got a light inside there, but obviously it's just the two uh, strobes on either side, hey? Yeah, so the one strobe is, is actually both strobes are pretty much uh, above shining down. Okay. And, and the other thing that I also have with my strobes is um, I design uh, my own snoots. And so for certain subjects, I'll have different sets of snoot attachments which work for a certain application. So, yeah, you know, here you can see I've, I've pretty much lighted the left hand side and the right hand side coming from above. And, and the, the light beam was narrow enough that it just went into that middle section of, of the mouth. That's fantastic. Um, Then, once again, here is where, uh, with my photos, like I say, often I, I use my purpose made and design fittings. So it's one thing for me now to, to separate the, the subject from the background, but, of, not of, but sometimes you also want to show it with a little bit of, of its environment. And it, then gives people a sense of scale, especially people who might know what they see in, in, in the environment. And so if I were to use my strokes on its own, first of all, you'll see a very, very busy reef. But because I've got my one strobe with a, a, a narrow beam, but a, a concentrated beam onto the nudie bra, and then a, a wider, like almost like a box section going onto the reef, but with a diffuser to give a softer light, just to give a little bit of light on the edges of, of the rock. And uh, it's like uh, some kind of growth. It's not kelp, but like kind of similar that it's sitting on just to, to highlight those edges, but still have not all of that illuminated. And, and, and keep the attention on, on to the actual subject. And this is the last one on the macro side that I've included. This is now we, we completely in the realm of super macro. Um, this is one of the, the photos that I didn't took in South Africa that was taken in the uh, Philippines. Um, this little shrimp is called a sashimi shrimp. Um, they come in a, quite a number of varieties where the head is a color and then the back section of, of the body is another color and there's one specific one where the head is quite of a green color and the tail looks like tuna sashimi and that's where the name comes from. To give some indication of size, the overall length of its body is the size of a rice, uh, uh, rice grain of rice. Um, the light that I use to illuminate them, my strobe, my aperture is two millimeters in diameter. Sure. And that was just outside of a frame, was it away from the um, shrimp. So that light that we see, oh, and the snoot is designed to, to cast a, a very parallel beam of light. So the beam of light that we see is say four millimeters wide, and that's already going out out of the frame. <laughs> That's so crazy. The macro photography and the super macro, it is, it is very challenging. Um, and like you, you have to think of all the other principles that you'll normally apply to any of your photography 
fields. So like you have to think about composition, you have to think about lighting, you have to be technical, uh, correct, that you have to be in focus. And all of that, like I say, happens while you are moving and the subject is moving and often the, 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 the um, surface it's sitting on is moving. So what I normally rely on on, on the super macro is even not to rely on autofocus, but I have to do that with mainly by moving the camera back and forwards because the, <laughs> the, the camera often doesn't even pick up, it just can't uh, uh, find the focus. That's and then crazy. sometimes you get lucky, like I did here, and, and you find at the right time when you take the photo to have another little interesting looking creature in the frame. But I mean, to, to, that, that's not something you can plan. That is like, that's pure, pure luck. But it happens if you spend, it's like the Gary player saying, the more yes. I practice, the luckier I get. That's right. <laughs> so the more time <laughs> one spent, and, and you find the things. Gio, um, Johan Kreiling uh, wants to know, do you, do you place these uh, snoots um, on your stroke before or while you're shooting? So, I mean, is it something that you can take a couple of okay. uh, options with you? Yes, so what I have designed is, um, and, and that's an ongoing process. So uh, when, when that one was taken, what I had is I had a design with a, um, a, a threaded end, and onto that threaded end I could fit in different fittings. Right. What I have now is I've got a threaded end, but what I attach to the threaded end is like almost like if you think about a, ba um, a barrel gun. So I can twist the barrels to give me different okay. shapes. So it's, it's and, like, the, it's like the, the, um, what do you call it, a magnifying glass that's got those, uh, the different magnification uh, things. You just turn it to the next one or to the next one, similar to that. Yeah, it's like something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then I've got, uh, like I said, Okay, some fitting suites give me more a, a box shape, then obviously I have to take that fitting off. So, so yeah, I, I, I've got, uh, I would say the overall foot is attached at the beginning of the dive, and then during the dive, I will put at the end bit, but I, what subject I find, I will then alter the end bit. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the next subject, subject that, or topic that we're moving on to is, is one of that personal uh, projects I will keep on working on is, is abstract. And I think the abstract was a natural outflow from the macro because you are so uh, looking at the detail of, of the subjects that it just, you start realizing or noticing more detail and more detail and then it comes, uh, the photographer comes into play where you now start seeing maybe shapes or features that you want to tell. And like one for me was like, it, it, from the from architectural side, uh, one of the architects uh, that I greatly admire is Anton Gaudi. And it kind of uh, reminded me of, of some of his work. And I always wondered if he, I don't think he dived because I think it was before his time that uh, or he was before scuba diving was invented. But if, if he saw in other literature or drawings or I, I know he lived close to the ocean, but if you look at some of his buildings and, and especially like his mosaic work on his buildings as well, it, it so reminds me on, on what I see. This is a, a, a juvenile octopus in a white mussel shell. So it's, it's just a one leg with the suckers at the end. and then how they are able to change the colors of that pattern and and, and um, that you can go completely brown or like white with brown spots and the size of spots that can change instantaneously but yeah it's just it's just on the side that i wonder if anton gaudi was inspired by some of these ocean creatures yeah the the texture and the detail there looks fantastic yeah Thank you. Um, so I think us as photographers, one of our most important skills to have is the ability to see and, and note. And that is why this project for me personally, I think is very beneficial because it, it's, 
I, I probably I should have done it. I, sh I should have uh, just had a photo of what these creatures look like when you actually see them with the eye or you see them on the reef. And then it is to, to realize what they can become. And I think that is one of those skills that a good photographer is born with. Um, and I think like any skill one can practice it and, and further hone it. But that is, I think, why people end up being photographers. And because they have that ability to see things that many other people miss seeing it. And it takes a, a person like a photographer to, to highlight it. And then people can go, oh, OK, I see it. But for me, it is important when we work with abstract is still to apply my rules of composition, uh, have the good lighting and have the technical things in focus. So I must know what I want to tell with the photo and not just take an abstract. And like here, I've got my leading lines going uh, diagonal from bottom left to top right. There's the reverse one also going from top left to bottom right. I've got a center focus point and then using my show, uh, depth of field to, to create the focus where I wanted to the focus to be there in the center. Um, yeah, and I think if, if you remember the, the, I've actually got this one printed on, on, on my wall, it was behind me when we started the conversation. Um, it, I think from, from the underwater photography side, the, the abstracts is also ones that often tend to be bought because it makes more artistic print. That's right. Where, People like to see a seal, they like to see a, a, a shark and so forth. But it's, it's more, more things that like the sharks will go or we'll get later to like the sardine and those things. It's more like maybe in a corporate environment, where it's, but it's not so often that people would put them on, on the wall at, at home. But the um, abstracts, they, they tend to work more. And what, how, how big are these and, and what is your aperture when, you, when you're shooting them? Okay, um, so you, uh, I, I knew you were going to ask me <laughs> a question. I, I didn't prepare in this. Okay, that was taken some time ago. But uh, to give you an idea, that would have been taken by a 60 millimeter macro lens with a 10 times the upper on, on the outside. So okay. with the macro, we, we able even if you shoot um, uh, DSRL you have uh, the fittings that you can put uh, the opters with the opters that you can put on, on the outside of, of the housing so that you can change during a dive if you shoot macro um, but I would say my aperture was probably be around six on that photo um, like in this photo, uh, it's, it's even less. In this photo, I, I've got a reverse lens. So I'm using reverse macro lens. So here, I've, I, once, once I close the housing, my aperture is set uh, for, for the dive. Um, and I can't have a, because the, the, the camera obviously has now no more uh, communication with the lens because the lens is turned the other way around. Right. Um, so I, I don't know how those f-stop numbers then relate. So I, I know the f-stop number that the lens was on was 5.6, but I don't know if it's still seen by the camera. Right. Okay. Because I, yeah, I, I don't have that technical knowledge. Um, I don't know if somebody. Well, might yeah, maybe someone can answer in the in the comments and let us know. Yeah. So yeah, this, this one, once again, for me, it's just like the importance of like how all the different elements comes together in a sense of you have to look at the lighting. And here I use once again, the, the lights to, to, to highlight this foreground, but it's the same on the other side. So this, the, this thing looks like a basket, if I can put it that way, the, the creature uh, or the, the, this front bit. So these, highlights or these feathers that you're seeing is what we're seeing there in the background as well. But I use a different, uh, so when I dive, I either dive with two strokes or four strokes. So I had a different fitting 
on on the one stroke to highlight this front bit and then another fitting on the other stroke to just give a soft light on on the back and i i think it's it it might be coming clear i i love spending my time on the water and and <laughs> and i see it as as a studio it's 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 a studio where you move around with everything that you have and it's a wonderful studio to be in because there's just an endless number of of subjects to to choose from and and you can go up down left right wherever you want to go and um as long as uh, you pay attention to uh like like for example here say for instance i had my lighting and everything set up like it was in this photo and then i decide to take the photo but i want to put the light or the focus on on the back feathers i'll have to readjust my light because it will not be giving me the light i want anymore and the smaller the creature is or the subject is that you photograph like with that super macro it's it's literally sometimes not sometimes it's always like millimeter adjustments that i have to make mm. to the end bit of my snoot otherwise sometimes you completely miss yeah this you get a black black frame and it's like if you, if you move just so ever so slightly then it's 100% correct but yeah it's 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 ours <laughs> <laughs> but uh so the previous two subjects was both stationary subjects the the difference between the first one which is like a city and bells was a white one the second one is a, a feather duster worm so that is actually like the the feelers of of a, it's a type of a tube worm it comes out of the tube and then those feathers opens up into this basket shape um but they stationary on one section on the reef where now I've taken it to what I think is is a next step up. So this is the eye of a clip fist. So obviously the clip fist is going to be moving. Um, this is where the other section comes into play. You've now learned about your skills on photography that you have to master, but you also have to learn the skills on how do you interact with your your subject, your wildlife, because there's nothing that tells the clip fist to stay where you want it to be, and you have to learn the, the body language of your subjects and try to learn what you can do to make them feel relaxed and yeah it, it's once again it just comes with time nothing is going to pick there's not a handbook that you're going to pick up and tell you okay with clip face you do this and this and this and then they'll be relaxed you have to put in the time um, Oh, then that's that's fantastic! Again, it like it looks like little flames from a from a gas burner. That's exactly what it, what it's called. Yeah. So, uh, if if you remember the first nudie bra that we saw, those things on the back. The, so this is a different type of nudie bra, and this is what its protrusions looks like. And uh, locally, we call it the gas flame nudie bra. And so it's it's just once again drawing on. I think when you're doing abstracts, it's drawing on your visual library that you build up and, and, and the references. And then it's like, okay, how can I frame that section of, the, of, of that animal or creature to create the image that I wanted to create? And this is obviously what I wanted to create is that, that look of, of a gas flame fireplace. And yeah, luckily the colors are, and, and the nudie itself is, is perfectly suited for the topic so it was just a matter of getting the, the right frame and once again for me example of of drawing on on your visual library that you have in your mind so we in cape town we all know the arum lilies and it's a beautiful flower to me so what we see here is uh, that nudie bra, when they lay the eggs, they lay in fantastic little other patterns or shapes. So this, all this white is tiny little nudie bra eggs. You can see the eggs in, in the top detail. So depending on how I was illuminating the subject, this egg mass, and where my camera angle was, it would either then 
remind me of a Adam Lilly or a seashell, like a scone seashell. So I, I took both varieties, but I've now included the, the Adam Lilly variety. But for me, it's also important, like when, when you do now an abstract study like this, is give some reference of, of what it is that the person is looking at. Maybe for a non-diver, I, I need to tell and, and highlight that those are eggs, but divers will tend to, to pick up on what it is and, and know what they're looking at. But leave that visual clues there. And, and then for the rest of the egg mass, I was happy to have that very shallow depth of field and just that soft light um, highlighting it and, and to, to create that form and shape. So now we're moving on to the other main category for underwater photography, which is the wide angle. And I think immediately what's, what's very evident is what comes into play with wide angle photography is a much easier and much more abundant use of the natural light. Yeah. So now we playing with natural and uh, artificial light and one can either balance them or try to balance them or you can have the one play off against other or only use the one. So yeah, in, in this frame, I'm trying to at least have a little bit of a highlight here at the bottom. Uh, and for me, like I'll give a, like in detail, well, what I'm trying to do here is like, um, from a storytelling point of view is when you in nature, you see an abundant uh, uh, bunch of similar creatures, you can know that there is a story, something is happening. There's a reason for it why it is like that. So the story behind this is, this is now what was uh, Pampuinkis, uh, urchins. Yes. Now, how it works in, in, in our ocean is, crayfish eat the urchins. But because our crayfish stock is under pressure, the urchins doesn't have so much natural predators. And that is why we're seeing what we're seeing in this photo. There's just like full on reef covered with urchins as, as far as you could see. So it, it's another section that comes into play with underwater photography, which is most of the time also wildlife photography, is you have to know the wildlife and, and, and what makes a story. Well, so if, if, if you don't know the story, then you probably swim past it and, and, and you're not going to realize it, but there's something that you can tell in, in this frame. Um, so yeah, that's, that's from a storytelling point of perspective. But I think the only thing I wanted to highlight with that is it's not, for me personally, it's not a thing of do I only focus on the light or this or that. It's like you constantly have to take all of that into consideration. And like I say, those it, it's actually quite a, um, a fun development thing where after dive, if you sometimes go back in your memory after dive and you, it's like, I've seen that, I've seen that, and I've seen that. And I so wish I saw that with that. And I would like to photograph that like that. And then you wait for that day until it all comes together. But it's so important to build those visions and, and visualize those photos that you would like to take. Somehow how it works, I don't know, but somehow it works out that you'll end up on a day where it comes together and it's all in the right place at the right time for you to take the photo. The, the wide angle also allows us to, to take uh, portraits of more uh, larger subjects like this um, octopus. Um, here I looked at, at where I was, where the octopus was and what play my lights would have. So I knew I could go with this black and white study because he was on, on fairly white sand. So I was able to kind of uh, have a overexposed on, on, on the sand, but still the dark octopus would, would not be overexposed. And, and that allowed me to have a very graphical. Um, and also if, if, if I looked at what was happening with the shadow scars on, on these valleys and roofs, uh, I think it, it was a nice outcome. 
Yeah, I really like it. I think it's got such a nice feel to it. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's just once again, like with that first photo, the, the ability to, to use a, a very fine balance between our, the artificial light and then the natural light. So the light rays is from the sun. It, it illuminates the, the shark to a degree, but I needed to bring just a little bit of fill light to, to make it pop from the, the blue background because a large section of the shark itself is also quite blue. Um, so depending also obviously what one wanted to do, if, if I wanted to have just like this eye section and the fins come out and the rest, just melt away with this dark, dark blue. That was another option, but so it, it, it's what I said earlier. As an underwater photography, we are spoiled with choice in a sense of how we can paint with light. And you have to pay attention and master that to, to be aware of, of your light sources, where they're coming from and what you can do with them. To, to have good impact and, and it just opens up the doors of possibilities. The other uh, section that, that um, the white angle offers us is to, to show the animals or the creatures in the environment. Um, this is, like I say, in Cape Town, we can see how colorful our reefs are. Um, but as I was trying to highlight earlier it's so many aspects that need to come together to, to give you uh, some idea with the normally with the underwater with a wide angle we use fisheye so this is a 10 millimeter fisheye and a cup sensor and the seal on the most left hand side if if i reached out i could touch it so that's that's a closeness you get with wow. the subjects and it's so that's a one side. The other side is, this is like a little grotto or swim through. And I, with my gear, fits in like, it's not a squeeze, but I, if, if I'm not neutrally buoyant, then, then you're going to hit the top. Uh, so you, it's, it's a tight fit. So to, to get the seal so relaxed that they actually come and join you in that confined space, that's once again that other section that I talked about. It's where it, it's not just photography, it's not just the light and the shutter and the sharp focus when you deal with wildlife. You have to learn your subjects, their behavior, and you have to learn behavior from your side that makes them relax and, and, and feel comfortable with you. Because it's not like a person that you can say, okay, you go there, you go there, and then you can take the photo. But yet that is the kind of aim I have in my wildlife photos where they, the, the, stage is probably not the, the best word to use, but it must look like everything was at, at the perfect place. And it, it, it only happens when, when you pay attention to all that, all that detail. Um, so just to give a little small insight also, for example, if, if we look at to, to the left hand side of the, the seal on the most left, we can see the difference in light on the reef uh, as opposed to the, say this bottom section or even on, on the top right. And what's causing that different color in, in the water there is just a light bouncing off the seal, even though the seal skin is quite dark. And that is a very difficult section to learn in underwater photography is just the impact your reef structures and your subjects have in how the light will bounce around in your frame. Um, because that is so different from what would happen on the shore because it's just with the water and the little particles in the water, everything has a much bigger impact on how the light will distribute. And, and it's important to learn to deal and, and, and resolve those issues. So 
this is highlights uh, what I'm saying is like you have to learn the the behavior of of your subject. So if if I were to look at this photo and didn't know the seals, I would think this is a aggressive behavior, but this is a playful behavior. He's actually trying to come to me and try to initiate play. And luckily I knew it <laughs> 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 because otherwise, <laughs> you, yeah, you, you, you will most likely get a little bit of a fright um, because that, that, that literally comes along with a loud bark. So it's, it's like a dog coming to you with a big bark and that bark vibrates through your body underwater. But if you see and observe how they play with one another, that is exactly what they do. So shortly after this, another one of them broke up a piece of kelp and brought that to me wanting for the two of us to play tug of war. So they're very playful creatures. And I've only been in one scenario where there was an alpha male that wasn't happy with me in the territory and then to know okay there's a difference between what he wants and what this one wanted um but it, it was quite clear <laughs> so <laughs> then it's time to move on absolutely <laughs> um and then the other very nice benefit of a wide angle uh, if i say wide angle is you, you can achieve this with macro it will be just uh, a lot more difficult but um, I have to uh, let me explain a little bit further so with your macro lenses we use flat ports so the glass in the front is, is a flat piece of glass when you use uh, wide angle lenses we use a dome port so when you have a dome port on your housing it's easier to get this effect where we what we call a split level and this allows you to then capture the same frame both what's going on below the waterline as well as what's going on above the waterline. And that makes for some really interesting and, and uh, beautiful photos. Um, That's spectacular. I absolutely I love that. The, the, the bigger your dome is, the easier it is to get that right. And so it, it's just like, I think, I think I know I've got a, a a seven inch dome and then people who like to do this type of uh, photo they they sit with like a 12 to 15 inch dome so it's once again it's like what you you kind of have to decide like and i'm going to take split levels and that's all I'm going to do or going to take some split levels and I'm going to take the seals underwater because to you can imagine to swim around with a 15 inch dome underwater I mean it, it will be crazy you'll, you'll use up a lot of your air, air consumption will be more because you've just got so much more that uh, equipment that you have to push through the water um, but with, with a little bit of uh, effort you, you can use a smaller dome and still get a good photo. So next topic, um, it's going to be what I call the essence. So in, in this project is where I would either look at the scene or the subject and see, okay, what to me in this scene or subject is the essence of, of, of it and try to just capture that. And this was a reef scene and this was this is another this is a second photo that wasn't taken in south africa this is also taken in the philippines so i was invited last year to go and dive in the philippines for a month and now this was towards my end of my trip and i've seen so many day after day reef sections and it's all beautiful i'm not complaining but <laughs> now it's a time to say to myself okay i can either take just another reef seen or what to me is is making this section of the reef stand out and and how can i highlight that and for this photo i used four strokes and then angled them just to highlight this portion of the reef because to the left and to the right and to the back there's more of, of the same kind of thing although these were the most uh, the, the white orange bits is sponges and then the other bits is soft coral. So the, this, this was the most prominent section of the reef and, and I wanted to just have that because I think with only 
that's illuminated and the rest of of the reef black it, it made it just so much more stand out and almost like a like a kind of a japanese still life feel mm. to it oh, it's beautiful but when i'm working in in, in this project the essence um the the macro life is it's i think it's kind of easier because it's it's I have more control over the snood fittings and where the light is going. So this is a black nudie uh, and it's got this highlight, this blue highlights. So I was wanting to just put light on those blue highlights and then have the, the black body just fade into the black background. Um, so for for this to work is once it's it's your light obviously only had to heat the, the blue and as little of the rest of the body as possible. The nudie had to sit in the right location and also obviously the pose. Um, so like for example, when I say it's ongoing, I had this idea of wanting to take that photo like three, four years prior to taking the photo. And then like adjusting and, and redesigning the fittings and looking for the, the subject to be in the right place came only that number of years later. And there's still another uh, one of these that I wanted to do where it would be just full on side on and I'll just have the, the light on this. So you'll just see maybe a blue tip and then the yeah. side line and, and yeah. But yeah, so is to have those ideas of what you want to achieve and then you work out, okay, how I'm gonna do it. And then you wait for the day that you find, find it where you can actually put it into practice. Till you find yourself in the right place in the right time and, uh, and it all works. Yeah. So this one is, it's a orange slap nudie. So here the main feature is, is orange. And uh, the, the difference for me when I found this one was is normally you'll find them on the reef but this one I actually found it like you can see on, on the sandy bottom and that I liked in the sense that I could have either had the, the, that black background but then I put some light on the actual sand and because of the very shallow depth of field it, it, it created a more white background and it, it just work for me in that way it's got like a really dream dream feel to it and these nudies are very dreamlike creatures it uh, it almost looks like a, a water droplet um you know that's that's landed in a puddle and it's uh, just sort of you know blown up like that yeah no yeah. yeah so that's that's a very good uh, observation quentin and the other what i always thought about it is like um and I can't remember the, the artist's name, but it was an artist who he, he used to paint mainly sailboats. Uh, it was an English, and I think it was from the 17th century. And it's like one of these sailboats, like sailing out of the mist. And like you've got the fog, misty background, and, mm. and, and this is this coming out of it. This one um, is, is also a sea slot, but it's not a nudie bra, but. Um, it was like years ago seen for the first time in Cape Town and then for many years nobody saw it again and then we we got to see it again um, about it's about now six years ago and because of uh, itself being green so the, the, the sea slug is green it's sitting on a, a blade of sea grass which is green but then it's got these two horns with the blue dots and so it was amply called the Shrek nudie. Although it's not really a nudie, but it's very close. But yeah, for me, the, the, the main feature then was these, these two little horns that uh, Shrek had and then the, the blue dots I wanted to highlight. So that, that was one of the photos I, I captured of, of the Shrek nudie. That's beautiful. I, I, you know, the, the way that the, um, the, the, the horn on the left-hand side um, behind it's got that lighter green uh, it's just uh, it's just yeah, as you say right place right time right everything you know very nice yeah. but so it's like 
this is sometimes like the question that we have in wildlife photography. Do I arrive at the scene and I sit there and I wait? Or do I arrive at the scene and there has to be something there already I can take a photo of? And I think often with, with uh, especially like the macro studies, it's like this, this moody, the sea slug is moving. So see in which direction it's moving and, and then know, okay, is it worthwhile for me waiting or is it not worthwhile for me waiting? Because um, it's very seldom that you're gonna arrive at the scene and it's already all in the right place, but you have to observe and see what's going on and, and then decide, do I wait or do I, do I move on? This one is one of my personal favorites in the sense that it was a very challenging photo. So it was, uh, I, I use again that um, reverse macro lens. So it's completely manual focus and all the other settings is dialed in. I can't adjust that during the dive other than the shutter speed. And then I was busy diving and I saw this, I, I don't know what you call it, but it almost looks like, I don't know if you know what a tall boss is. Those things that like fumble around when the wind blows. In the, yes. Like you always see it like in the movies in the desert scene. That's right. It almost looked like something like that. And um, I was diving in, in the Nysna Lagoon and the tide was busy going out. And one of these things came drifting towards me in, in the current. And then I saw this nudie on it. So what we see in the background is, is that I'm going to call it for this exercise bush, which is now so blurred out because of the shallow depth of field. And then I was like, I don't think I'm going to get this right because this thing is now moving at a speed. I've got such shallow depth of field and a manual focus, but I kept on trying. And yeah, and eventually I got that way. I had what to me, and this, this is called um, the twin crown nudie. So it's these yellow bits is where the crown is coming from. So I had that yellow bits of, of a twin crown nudie in, in focus and it, it gave that very shallow depth of field. And uh, the Nasa Lagoon water is often kind of murky. So because I had the very shallow depth of field and quite uh, close to the surface. So we still have, even though it's a macro photo, a fair amount of um, natural light coming in. Uh, created that like almost like a watercolor feel to it. And um, I've actually also had this one printed on, on a fine art watercolor paper and it, it just came out really good, if I'm, I say so. I'm pretty sure that our um, aviation photographers are looking at this and saying, no, no, that looks like um, whatever jet model it is and there's a smoke trail behind it and you can see the vortices of, uh, of the smoke coming off the wings. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and then this is a, the last photo in, in this uh, category, the essence, is just to show that um, that theme like we saw in the first photo, it, it's just not limited to the small creatures. You can apply it to the bigger and, and the swimming around creatures like this is a blue shark. And here I use the four strokes, but I use the four strokes so that I could illuminate the whole length of its body, but can use a soft amount of light. So I could just hit that profile and, and just like to me, that's the essence. I have that blue line of the blue shark. And anybody who have seen a blue shark in, in real life, that, that blue on the top of them is just a fantastic, unique color blue that, that yeah, it just stands out. So I wanted to highlight that blue and then obviously the profile, the shape of the shark. So lastly, we're going to move on to the natural history. <clears throat> and I think this for is me, so, um, what, what probably has come through so far in, in my presentation is that the, to me at least, there's not one section that stands apart from the other. It's like, because I'm so much in the water, I'm, I am most likely going to be seeing and observing natural history. And some of it is going to be things that is not or hasn't even been uh, documented before. And this was one of those cases where it's uh, a massive smack of box jellyfish. And 
what I got to see was there would be a number of bases of this jellyfish with these columns going up into the water column. And this is only one of those water columns. So even with a uh, 10 millimeter fish eye, I could only fit in one of those water, uh, one of those columns going up. <clears throat> and I mean, this, this has been circulated to, to the people who study the species and, and none of them have seen it before and none of them know what, what is happening here. Um, so maybe sometime in the future, uh, we will learn what, what was going on here, but it might be some kind of a mating ritual, um, but it, it's not known for sure. But I think it's very rewarding from a photographer point of view and a nature lover point of view, that opportunity or that possibility to, to stumble a, across scenes like this. It, it was just like, uh, obviously made my my year <laughs> Can I put it that way are you are you sure you didn't see a, a little shack towards the side uh, the 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 video village where Steven Spielberg and a couple of other guys were sitting watching the footage <laughs> it kind of looks like one of those uh, alien invasion type uh, movies I, I know one of them uh, it's a, um, it's, it's a, which is the director um, the one who made that avatar. Avatar, yes. Yeah, Chris Vessels. I know Vessels. he's very much into, into uh, scuba diving and yeah. underwater. And, and, um, uh, so I, I know some of them definitely draw their inspirations from what they see on the water. And right. I mean, if you look at some of the alien creatures, it's, it's, yeah. it's quite evident. Um, so in, in natural history, we also uh, fortunate to obviously know of certain events that happens on a yearly basis. And this is one of them, which is the Sabine run. So that makes it a bit easier. You, you can prepare for what you hope to see. It doesn't guarantee that you will get to see it. Um, and then it's, I think once again, it's like when you're there, it's like to have an idea of, of a story that you want to tell or have the ability to form that story as it's unfolding in front of your eyes. So for me, in this frame, why it, the story I wanted to tell is so much focus is being put on the predators normally when you, you take photos of, of a sardine run. And yet, without the sardines, there will not be an event like the sardine run. So they, is, they for me, as important as any of the predators. And also, I wanted to, so it's, it's, a, it's, that's why they've got for me prominence in, in the photo. And the other side of the story is, um, you've got so many predators eating them. So if I say many, I'm referring to different species. You had sharks, you had tuna, you've got the gannets, you've got whales, um, and, and some other um, predator fish. So it was that uh, message of us against, against them. So it's like all, all the, sardines against all the rest. And, and that's why I've put the frame together like, like this. And, and then it comes with time, like I was saying earlier, it's like this, this is not a event where you could go to and know that it's going to happen, but by observing fish behavior or species behavior through the years, you know when they start moving in a certain way that something is happening. So I could see in, in the movement of all the little fishes, I could see that the game fish was coming in before I could see the game fish. And knowing that behavior then, then prepares you, it's not necessarily going to put you in the right place at the right time, but at least you are wary and you are on the lookout for, okay, something is about to happen. And now we back to the, the macro, but also behavior. So what we're seeing here is, is a bobtail squid and they about between 10 to 15 millimeters in length. And then what we see here is I saw one and I haven't seen another photo of that being taken or presented is where it actually caught a juvenile bobtail. So if, if you look in the front of it, you see something that's like very 
see like opaque with black dots. That is a juvenile that it got caught. You can see the little flat ring on, on the side and the little tiny tentacles. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's one of those things that yeah, once again the right place, right time. But when you get it, it's just like wow, it's it's you never this is not something i could have imagined i would ever get to see if if for example um like after this photo i contacted the, the university of cape town and wanted to ask them okay but so what what do the uh, the bobtails eat and they they don't even have that knowledge to know what the bobtails eat because it's not a species that has been studied so yeah, to get to witness something so first and that, that it's not even knowledge is, is I think, an amazing reward for all the time. And for me, this one was also just as rewarding. So these are um, uh, red eye, evil eye, humbucks, amphipods. I, I, I think it's red eye amphipods. So once Again, the, the size of these are they each about between three and four millimeters in, in length. And when I dived down onto that section of the reef, I first saw the movement and I thought like, okay, that must be one of the biggest red eye amphipods I've ever seen. And then when I had a close look, I could see what they were actually busy doing is these tiny creatures who are hunting together. And they were bringing down this creature. I don't know what it is that's now lying below these six. And, and now by this time they've already killed it and they started predating on it. But so I've, I've got a series of photos where one can actually see these tiny creatures hunting as a pack, pack together to bring this creature down. And once again, it's like from the knowledge I previously had, it's like pack hunting is normally uh, something that's reserved for much uh, species much higher up in in your uh, food chain so it's it, it's an amazing sight to see and, and to learn that about a species that there's virtually no knowledge about and just my last photo is just once again one of the Sardinian photos is where I was saying earlier it's like to, to see the story as it unfolds so for me and on this bait ball, um, we got to see this whole bait ball being depleted. So every single sardine was eaten. Uh, and none of the people I spoke to afterwards who was on the dive didn't share the feeling that it, it was an emotional event to see because you kind of hope that at least one or two of them would escape and, and not the whole bunch is being but it's nature, so I, we understand that, but it's just still, but then as it was happening, you can see this bait ball being like just squashed. Um, it took on this shape and it, 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 so it was just to move into like a little bit of, uh, to the left and a little bit to the right to get that hard shape. <laughs> and then we've got the one shark coming on from the top and the one excellent on the left which is like almost like your virtual arrow through, through yes. the heart. I see that. So yeah, it's, it's just to, to, to see those uh, moments arriving. And and, and, um, and I think that's where, what I was trying to say earlier, where uh, having a project like that abstract learns you to see shapes and, and, and things very quickly. And, and then it, it pays off in a scenario like this. And that's that's my last slide. I, I, so, I really like this uh, this one. There just there's so much going on there. You've got uh, you know all the textures, all the colours. Uh, you know the predators from all over the place just uh, attacking that bait ball. It's crazy. Yeah, it's 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 like I I wish uh, I mean there is videos out of it, but still to hear it uh, first and. Um, like there's so much going on, but that sound that, that gannets make when they enter the water, it is truly, it sounds like, and, and I was in, in, in the military, so I know what a gunshot sounds like. It sounds like gunshots going off. And like in the first section of the dive, even though like you're aware it's gonna happen, it's like it happens, it's like, 
what's making that sound? <laughs> it's yeah. like, who's shooting? Yeah. And it's like, no, it's a gannet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just amazing to see them. And, and what was also fascinating about this is you'll see a gannet and you'll see a shark go for the same sardine. And say the gannet gets it first, the shark will turn away and go and look for another bunch of sardines. Wow. I mean, you would have thought that the natural instinct would be like, oh, bigger meal, just take both. But Absolutely. While the bait ball was going on, every predator respected the other predator. So whoever got the sardine first, it was their meal. Wow. Once the sardine, uh, once the bait ball was finished, then I could see a little bit of interest from the sharks to the gannets because now the, the gannets were sitting on, on the water. Yeah. Uh, some of them just like now full, I haven't, <laughs> and now there's no fish there. And now there was a bit of interest. I didn't saw a shark taking one, but I can imagine that would then happen. But during the bait ball, there was like absolutely no competition. It's like, yeah, it was just amazing to see. That's crazy. Oh, well, right, thank well, you, uh, Quentin. Now, if there's any questions, I don't know if there's any questions that came in. Um, people are more than welcome to contact me also even afterwards. Um, okay. I'm, I'm just going to stop your... Uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, put your, your details on there for now. Um, and then there, there were one or two questions, but I, I think what you can do is, um, if you've got a chance afterwards, just go and have a look through and uh, see if there are any uh, specific questions. But... Um, uh, let's have a look here. Um, I scrolled past that one now. Uh, it was uh, relating to focus stacking. I think it was uh, Chris Vessels. Um, with the more static creatures, um, is focus stacking an option? And I, I guess most shots are not stable enough and held handheld. And obviously, you were also saying with the, 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 the macro, you moving, the currents moving, the, the creatures moving, it's uh, focus stacking, I don't think would be an option, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I think you'll have to find something like, um, like almost maybe like, like a lagoon, which got very little title difference. Yeah. There you might be able to do something like that. But uh, in Cape Town, it's like we, we, we have a surge in Cape yes. Town. We don't have current. Even on the flattest of flattest days, <laughs> there's, there's surge. And um, yeah, it, it's uh, photo stacking won't work. Um, yeah, not, right. not, 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 really. I, I don't even think like, again, like if I had to compare it to what I experienced in the Philippines, they, they, you've got current, but even then, because something is pulling and moving the whole time, two frames are not going to look alike. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, stop your sharing. If you might, wouldn't mind switching on your uh, your camera again, and then uh, I can bring you up uh, as well. And while we do that, I'm just going to go and uh, see if there are any other questions here. Yes, um, a lot of a lot of people very uh, interested in seeing uh, the work, and uh, uh, got some cool uh, images and and some really nice comments as well. Um, but I think what uh, what you could possibly do is just uh, if you do get a chance, uh, you know, you can ask uh, or go and, and uh, check out the feed and, and see what uh, what people have said, um, and then you can answer any specific questions with regards the the detail that uh, that they um, that they that they're requesting. Um, but I think for you know, I mean, we we've gone a little bit over, which is which is good. Uh, it means there was a lot to say, um, and fortunately, Facebook didn't uh, shut us down. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to you know, uh, say a very big thank you to you. Uh, I certainly loved uh, the, the images. You know, you, you can't believe that something the size of a grain of rice or a couple of millimeters um, can, be, can be photographed in such detail. Um, but I suppose if you've got the equipment and the skill and, and the luck, uh, these things are, are possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, from my side also, once again, thank you very much and everybody who attended. Um, Greatly appreciate it. And yeah, I will definitely go and look at and, and answer the questions. Fantastic. Now that's great. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. I really appreciate it and hope you have a fantastic uh, afternoon. Thank you. You too as well, Quentin. Thank you. Thank you.